Death was arrested and our lives began, right? Praise God. Praise God for His grace. Will you, will you join me in prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we just uh, come before you this morning as your, your servants. God, we want to hear from you this morning. We want to be challenged and we want to be changed by you this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit will work in our hearts and our minds this morning, God. I pray, pray that you will show us who you are through this book of Revelation. I pray that we'll walk out of here encouraged, understanding that the battle that we're in belongs to you. That God, you've already won the war. We're just waiting for it all to be fulfilled. Thank you, God, for your love, your grace, and your mercy. I pray you will go before me this morning as I share what's in your word. I pray that I won't be a stumbling block to anybody, that they will hear clearly what you want them to hear from this book of Revelation. Thank you, God, for giving us your holy word that we can dive into on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. We need you this morning, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, man, I lost my voice a little bit on that. It could have been the game I was out yelling last night at the referees, but anyway. <clears throat> All right. Let's see where we're at. Revelation. We've been in, we've been in Revelation. We've been going through the book. We, we jumped back in the book of Daniel. We looked at some things there. Uh, we looked at some things in Matthew, trying to understand what God is doing in this book of Revelation. And in Revelation, we see a couple things. But mainly, it's the story of God's sovereignty. If, uh, as, as you read the book and you go from start to finish, Re- Revelation 1 to 22, you see that God is establishing his kingdom for eternity. And he's establishing it through the King, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it's really beautiful the way that we watch that and the way that we see it come out. And so there's this story, this vertical story of God's sovereignty, but then there's a horizontal story going on as well. There's a story of God's people and our need to be faithful in the midst of the battle, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of whatever's happening in our lives. God says, I want you to be faithful to Jesus Christ. I want you to be faithful to my word. And this morning we're going to see a little picture of that. You could turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. I mean, Revelation chapter 12. We're in Revelation chapter 12 this morning. And as you're turning into that, that book, I want to open with an illustration here, something I was thinking about. When I was a kid, I was probably like eight years old or something. We, we lived at, um, just, just outside Hagerstown in, in, in a little country setting. And there was this field behind our house. You know, when you're a little kid, you feel like your yard is forever, right? And then you go back and you see it as an adult, and it was like, wow, that's the smallest yard in the world. But hey, as a kid, you're like, this yard is forever, but there was this fence at the back of the yard. And my brother and I, we would go up to this fence, and we would look in that field, and we were like, man, we want to go explore today. And so every once in a while, we would attempt to hop that fence, but sometimes we didn't because we saw something in the field. It wasn't a regular cow, it wasn't a heifer, it was a bull. There was a bull in the field. And so we would, we would go to this fence and we would look and mom, mom and dad told, you're not allowed to go over there. You're not allowed to go over the hop the fence, go in that farmer's field or anything. But you know, we're kids. Mom, mom can't see us. You know, face is stuck with mulberries all over it. You know, wasn't supposed to eat those. But we're at the, we're at the back of the fence and we're, we're getting ready to see what's going on over there. And we want to go explore. And so we look and we don't see the bull. We know he's there, but we go. We hop the fence, and we're walking along, just exploring with our little sticks, doing whatever we're doing, and that's when we spot him, and he spots us, and this is what it feels like. It's like running with the bulls. Anyone ever been running with the bulls? No. Well, we were scared. The thing is, we knew the bull was there. We knew it was his territory, but because we couldn't see him, we thought, eh, it's okay. We didn't listen to mom and dad who said, here's the rules. Don't go over there in that territory. You need to stay here where you're protected. Don't don't, don't go into that land. And, And we said, we don't care because we don't see the problem. We think we know better. And so we jump in there, and then we end up running around like that. You see, the same thing happens in our Christian life. The same thing happens in our regular lives as we walk through this world. We walk around and we think that we can enter the territory of the bull. And the bull here that I'm talking about is Satan and sin. 
We think that just because we can't see Satan, because we can't see the enemy, the devil, that it's okay to hop that fence. It's okay to stick our hands and stick our feet into something that we really shouldn't be messing with. And it causes all sorts of problems. So often we have this bravado. We, we say, well, I'm a Christian. I can do this because uh, I'm good. We're this guy. We think that we're one of these guys in Matador. How often do you think that you're this guy when it comes to Satan and being the bull? I can take him. I'm strong enough. I can handle him. And then we end up like this. That's the more realistic picture when we try to mess around with Satan. You see, the Bible says that we should resist the devil. We should stand firm in our faith. But this idea of resisting the devil isn't necessarily about attacking him at battle. It's the idea of resisting the devil is standing firm in Christ and doing what he wants. And so today, in, in the lesson today, I want, us, I want us to see something. We need to view Satan like a bull that's on the other side of the fence. We need to, to view Satan like this enemy that's there that's waiting to grab us, that's waiting to gore us and waiting to hurt us. And we've got to stay away from him. We don't, we don't need to give him any more ammunition by the things that we watch or listen to, the things that we say, the places we go, the people we spend time with. We don't need to be giving him ammunition because he's already got enough. He's loaded up on hate. Satan hates God's people. He hates God. He hates what he's created. And so this morning, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the story of Satan. We're going to look at this enemy. But where are we? We're in the book of Revelation. Just a really quick recap. We are right here talking in the blue where it says seven-year tribulation. The rapture has already happened. The church is up and they're, they're with the Lord Jesus Christ waiting for him to touch down on earth and to set his reign. Wait to come back with him. And so we're in Revelation chap, chapter 12 today. And in order to get there, we saw that God brings judgments to his people. He brings judgments to this world to bring them back to himself. To bring his people back into the fold and say, hey, look, I love you, I love you, I love you, I want you, I want you to be part of my family. But you got to give in. And so God says, i got to pour out my wrath to get, one thing to get the world straight, but then to bring my people to myself. And he does it through seven seals. Seven trumpets and seven bowls that the intensity escalates along the way. So far, we've seen seven seals broken and seven trumpets have all been blown. And we, we ended last week with, with the seven trumpet being blown. But this morning, I want us to remember something. Go ahead and write it down. Take a picture. This is it. This is the point. I don't have bullet points the rest of the way through. This is it. Satan is a dangerous enemy. And although he's defeated... We're still in a battle that we need to be prepared for. Who believes we're in a battle today? We are in a battle today spiritually. We're in a battle physically with illness. We're in a battle with sin. There are people on the other side of the world right now that are in physical battles. You don't think Satan's behind that? Come on. He's doing everything he can to mess this world up, to take as many people down with him because he knows he's already been defeated. He knows he's going down. And it brings him some twisted joy to see people fall and fail. That's the enemy we're dealing with today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, about him. We ended last week with Revelation 11:19. It said this, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, access to heaven. John saw this, and within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant. So, so he sees the idea of the presence of God with his people. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. So what's to follow is God's judgment. God's power is on display. His judgment is really about to pour through in a special way. But then something happens. We get into Revelation chapter 12, and it kind of takes a turn. John is talking. He's got this vision happening, and he's seeing the future laid out before him, and then all of a sudden, he gets a vision of something else that happens. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. Sorry, I went a little too fast to hear. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. You see the picture here? There's a picture of a woman. 
Now, I had somebody message me a couple weeks ago and ask me, hey, hey Andrew, when, when is this stuff happening in chapter 12? And I was like, you're going to have to wait till we get here because then I'm going to give you my opinion. But it's just my opinion, okay? So this morning as we're going through this, I want you to understand something. We serve a God who is so much smarter than we are, a God who has an understanding that we don't have, a God who can see things, a God who can write his story, who can put his word on paper that can mean, that can, that can explain scenarios that have so many different fulfillments. And so as we're reading, I'm going to give one track, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that God could actually be be having multiple ways for this to be understood. But I will give you the one this morning. First of all, this woman clothed with the sun. Who is the woman? Well, this language, she's a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. If you recall back in Genesis chapter 37, Joseph, remember little Joseph and his coat of many colors? And he talks to his brothers. He has dreams. And, he, and in these dreams, it's... it's Things being laid out and fulfilled. It's, they're prophetic. And he looks at his brothers and his dad. And he, says, he says, he told to his brothers, listen, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father re- rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and have to bow down to the ground before you? Who was Joseph's father? Jacob also known as Israel. Jacob and Rachel. So as we we see this passage here in Revelation 12, we see this great sign appeared, which means that this is going to be some symbolism involved. When you see those words, so John saw a symbol, and this symbol was a woman, and she's described through the language of Joseph in his dream. She's described as Jacob, Rachel, and the 11 or 12 sons, including Joseph, the tribes of Israel. Okay, so as, we, as you read this and you think, who is the woman? I want you to think this is Israel. Ethnic, national Israel. People who are Jews by blood. God's chosen people. And it says she was pregnant and she cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Sammy's pregnant. Please don't have the baby today. Pregnancy. I've been through four labors with my wife. I didn't have the, I wasn't in labor. I, I watched her in labor and said stupid things. Uh, you feeling okay, honey? <laughs> Jesse, no. Don't, don't give her that one. Of course she's not feeling okay. She's in pain. But one of the most vulnerable positions a woman can be in is when she's giving birth. You know, she's got a child on the way. She can't think or focus on anything but that child in that moment. And so this is the picture that's being set up. John is given this vision of a a vulnerable woman, of Israel, that is absolutely vulnerable. And it it says here, in in verse 3 and 4, it says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour the child, her child, the moment he was born. All right, we're going to stop here for a second. So this this sign is given. This sign sets up Israel. Israel is shown, this picture of what's happening with Israel. And then as as a pregnant woman, as a vulnerable woman, can't defend herself, can't do anything, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this sign of this great dragon. Who'd like to see a dragon? I mean, this stuff comes on the History Channel and, and dinosaurs and all this kind of stuff. It'd be, it'd be really interesting to see a dragon, except we don't want to see this one. So there's this terrifying picture developing here. There's this woman in labor, and then there's this enormous... Massive dragon with seven heads and ten horns. So imagine, it's not just a dragon with one head, it's a dragon that's got seven heads. And then seven of those heads, I mean, and and, and some of those heads have one horn, and some of those heads have two horns that equal ten horns. So it's a really scary, crazy looking dragon. And they've got crowns on their heads. And so it's a picture of power and someone trying to take control. It's a picture of death and battle coming. 
And it talks about this, this dragon. It says its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth. And what was he waiting to do? He wanted to devour her child the moment it was born. This would be a really cool story to read to your kids at bedtime, right? It's, it's, not a, it's, it's actually a, a, a horror story. It sounds like it's some kind of a crazy fantasy thing. Dungeons and Dragons, it sounds like something out of a video game. But there's a reality to it. You see, even though there's a sign, there's a reality to the descriptions in this book. There's a reality to this, the descriptions in this language. Second Peter 2.4 speaks of something that reminded me of this when it talked about its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky. 2 Peter 2.4 says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Jude 6 says, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on that great day. I believe that when we're reading this language here, it's talking about the third of these stars are angels that we know today as demons. I believe this is a picture of rebellion in heaven. With Lucifer, who is Satan. Now we're going to see that a little bit later, that it's Satan. But, but we have to understand the picture that's being created right here. There's a picture of a woman. There's a picture of God's chosen people, Israel. And there's a picture of a dragon who's out to devour her child. This dragon, we're going to come to find out, is Satan. And verse 5 says this. She gave birth to a son. <clears throat> she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. That's, that's a reference to Psalm chapter 2, if you want to just mark that in your Bible. Psalm 2. Go back and read Psalm 2. I read it a couple weeks ago. Go back and read Psalm 2 for the, the illusion here who it's talking about. It's pointing to Jesus Christ as, as the, the king of the world at some point. It says, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. He's going to be in control. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. She gave birth to a son. So there's the picture of the woman. Then there's the picture of this dragon standing before the woman as she's about to give birth. And then it describes the, the child, a son, a male child, who's, who's set to rule and reign. And then it jumps all the way and says, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Does that sound like the story of Jesus Christ? Is that how it all played out? If Jesus is the child that Israel bore, and Satan was trying to devour the child, was Jesus born and immediately snatched in? No. He lived a life, right? But here's the point. John, God, as the Holy Spirit's given him this vision, he's trying to make a point that Jesus lived a life and when he was finished doing what he was supposed to do, he was snatched up to heaven to where? I should have underlined the other part. To his throne. It's interesting. You see, Satan, when he got the Jews to turn on their Messiah, on Jesus Christ, and he got them to crucify Jesus and to kill him at a at a cross, Satan cheered because he thought he'd won. But we just sang in a song where we see a cross, God sees the victory. Because without that cross, there's no resurrection and there's no Jesus on his throne. And so it's important to see that. Remember I talked about the fact that we have, there's a real enemy out there. There's a danger. We need to know that there's a danger in Satan. But, but here's the flip side of this. He's a limited danger. God is sovereign. God's in control. In fact, he's a defeated enemy. 
He's already lost. He lost that, that, that day at the cross and the resurrection. He lost the war. Because Jesus was snatched up to God. But the battle continued on. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God. Where she might be taken care of for three and a half years. Now, remember when I talked about the idea that, that there could be multiple understandings behind the words in the language here? Some people think that, that the woman is a picture of the church. Some people think that the son is a picture of the church. Most everybody agrees that the dragon is some form of Satan or people he's empowered. But regardless of that, we see this idea that Jesus is the one who is the victor. And so we can come into this today and we can understand and we need to know this. We need to know that the danger is real, but that we serve a God who is already victorious. And so we don't need to succumb to the attacks and and be fearful of the attacks that Satan gives us. But we need to understand that God's going to do something. It says the woman fled into the wilderness to, to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of. Isn't that cool? This woman, this Israel, or you could view it as the church, I believe it's Israel. This, this woman, Israel, was, was taken into the wilderness for three and a half years, and she is taken care of. That word taken care of in the Greek, it's the word nourished. It's the word grown. You see, she's being attacked by the enemy, and what does God do? He prepares a place of safety for her and he grows her in that process. Now, remember um, we were going through this idea of the seven-year tribulation and we talked about the two witnesses. Remember the two witnesses, they they witnessed for for three and a half years, they talk about who Jesus Christ is and they, they preach repentance and they say, hey, repent, repent, repent. And the Antichrist is shaking his fist in the background and he's so angry the whole time and, and he's upset and the world hates these people because they're telling the truth and the world hates the truth. They hate the truth that we are sinners by nature, that we are sinners the day that we're born and that sin requires a payment. That sin requires a penalty and that penalty is, is death. It's a broken relationship with God and an eternity and punishment away from God in hell and the lake of fire. That's what's required for the wages of our sin is death. The world doesn't like that truth. And if it doesn't like that truth, then it won't accept the truth that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, see, this woman fled into the wilderness for three and a half years, and these witnesses are talking for the three and a half years leading up to this point. And all of a sudden, something happens. Remember, the witnesses got killed in in, in chapter 11. They got killed, and then three and a half days later, they were resurrected right before the whole world's eyes. And things went crazy after that. And I believe that at that point is when the new three and a half years starts, that this woman is fled into the wilderness, that these Jews, these ethnic national Jews are going to be in the wilderness, fighting for their lives, running from Satan, running from the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, running from everything that is evil, and God is preparing them, and he's taking care of them in the process. So I, got a, I got a lot of notes here. I'm trying to make sure we're keeping on track. Well, let's, let's read what happens next. There's another, there's another break in the, in the language here. It says in verse 7, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Michael is the chief archangel. Michael's the one who's in charge of the armies, you know. He's, he's, got, he's the second in command, you know. He's, he's the one who Jesus sends out. He says, hey, go fight this battle for me. He's empowered by God. And he says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against this dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But the dragon was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. Andrew, when's this battle happening? Well, the last moment, remember when I was talking, we read a little bit earlier in the first few verses about the birth of the child. We talked about um, the, the tale of the dragon sweeping a third of the stars to the earth. I believe that that story a little bit earlier was talking about, you know, before, before the fall of man. 
You know, God created everything and something happened at that point where Satan decided he wanted to take over and he wanted to be in charge. And so there was something that happened in heaven and all of a sudden, you know, he, he somehow managed to get a third of the angels on his side, which is nuts. I don't understand that. I don't know what he was thinking, that he could be stronger than the one who created him. But he took a third of the angels with him, and now they're his demonic army. And and so they're roaming around trying to do different things, and they're trying to defeat the seed. They're trying to defeat Israel. They don't want Jesus to be born, but Jesus is ultimately born. And then it's like, oh, man. But now the the story shifts to the future, and, and we see here that this war breaks out in heaven. And I believe this war happens at the three and a half year point in the trip during the tribulation. I believe that. That, that Satan loses access to heaven in that moment. You see, right now, I believe that Satan has the opportunity to be standing in the courts of heaven, standing there and looking at God and saying, Andrew Leisure is a terrible person. He's a sinner. He's not right. He's got sin in his life. He's doing things he shouldn't be doing. He's not worthy to be on that stage and talk about your word. And I say, I feel like that all the time. But then I have to remember... The victory has already been won. And there is no condemnation in those who give their lives to Christ. And I've given my life to Jesus Christ. And so every time Satan says, he's not, he's not, he's not, Jesus says, I am, I am, I am, and he's behind me. That's what we need to remember. Remember. If there's anything you walk away with today, I want you to understand that we're battling a real enemy. And everything that happens to us, all the temptations that come our way are not just all all the time something that comes from us. We're being attacked by an enemy that wants us to fail. We're being attacked by an enemy that is running to God every chance he has to say that we are terrible people, that we're not worthy of the calling that's been laid on us. And he wants us to believe the lies that because we've sinned here, that we should just keep on sinning there. And when we do that, when we listen to the lies, then he wins in those moments. And we lose the battle even though the war has been won. But anyway, we see here that this Satan, this this serpent, this dragon was not strong enough. They They weren't strong enough to defeat Michael. Satan wasn't strong enough to beat one of the other angels. And they lost their place in heaven. And so at that point, Satan's not going to be able to stand there and accuse the brothers and sisters anymore. Let's continue reading. Verse 8, verse 9. says, The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So just in case we weren't sure who the dragon was, who is he? (laughs) That's very clear. And thank you, God, for giving me one thing that's easy to figure out, right? Thank you so much. The great dragon was the devil. That serpent. Now, all these descriptions are helpful in understanding that it is Satan, but it's also helpful in us understanding who our enemy is because who is our enemy he's that serpent that serpent from genesis chapter 3 when when the the serpent talked to eve and what did he say he said i want you to doubt god he said did god really say do not eat from the tree or you're going to die you see satan that's what he does he wants us to question God because he's, he thinks that if he can get us into a place of questioning God, then maybe we'll try to answer the things for ourselves outside of his word. But see, this ancient serpent was also called the devil or Satan, which means slanderer. He makes up lies about us. And he tells them to God, but he also tells them to ourselves, as I was talking about a few minutes ago. How many of us live a life where we constantly hear Satan in our ear and he's telling us lies about us? You can't tell that person about Jesus because you had some impure thoughts last week. You can't love your family the way you're supposed to because I know who you really are. 
You can't share the gospel message because you don't live a life that reflects the gospel message. And so then what happens is we get in this vicious cycle where we continually say, I can't share because I live a certain way, so I may as well just keep living a certain way because I can't win anyway. And we need to realize that the battle belongs to God. Jesus has already won the victory, but we just got to stay out of the field where the bull is. We got to quit running over that field and thinking that he's not there, he's not seeing us. And so what does it look like? Well, staying out of the field looks like standing firm in our faith. It looks like reading God's word. It looks like reading these stories. You know, this, this coming Wednesday, we're going we're gonna to do, a, um, in our youth group, the, the topic is going to be about jumping. About jumping when God says jump. And one of the reasons we don't jump is because we think God is too small to catch us. And that's a lie that Satan has us to believe. But one of the, the, the ways that we can learn to jump and one of the ways that we can learn to resist the devil is to read the book, is to read the word of God so that we know what happened in God's word. What happened all the times that God told people to jump? What did that jumping look like? And kids, you're going to break it down this week, Wednesday. But what does it look like to trust in God and to be faithful? What does it look like to resist the devil? Well, we have to read God's word to know. Yes, there, there are things in there that teach us and say, hey, Paul writes a whole bunch of teaching stuff. Do this, do this, do this. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But at the same time, as you read the Old Testament and you read the New Testament and you read the stories of the people who have been changed and impacted by God, you start to see where God showed up when it looked like the battle, battle was lost. You see, what Satan likes to do is he likes to tell us it's game over. He likes to tell us you need to live according to what the world says is important. Because that's how you win. You need to fight, fight, fight. But Jesus said, turn the other cheek. That's not the kind of battle that we're used to, right? Everything is backwards, upside down when it comes to what God says to do and what the world expects. You see, there's a perception that we've lost. But the reality is that we're winning. The reality is the battle has already been won. All right, so let's continue. It says that, that Satan and his army, they, they weren't strong enough. And so Revelation 12, 9, it says that the great dragon was hurled to the earth. Oh, I'm sorry. He leads the whole world astray. It's the character of who Satan is. It's what he wants to do. And I'm, I'm going to hit on that hard because we need to realize that. I know I keep talking about it, but deception is his, one of his greatest tools. How are you being deceived this morning? I can't serve in that ministry because I'm not good enough. I don't know it well enough. I can't attend that ladies group because what if they know who I really am? I can't go to the men's group because I might have to share my feelings. No, I'm kidding. Sorry, that's a joke. I hear that a lot. We don't share our feelings. We eat meat. Anyway. Let's jump ahead. Revelation 12.10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters, what? Who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. He's lost access. So the voices of the believers who are in heaven have called out in this moment. After Michael has thrown Satan to the earth and said, you've lost access to heaven. All of a sudden, heaven cheers and says, all right, we got it going out, guys. We're going to take the hill. Are you ready to take the hill? Because look, no longer does he have a place. He can't say anything anymore. Before he thought that he could, before he talked and he thought that it mattered and it didn't. And now he can't even say a word. There's a muzzle on him. In fact, he's out, of, he's out of heaven. He's out of the access. And then this is what they said. This is what this, this voice from heaven says. It says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. How do we, how do we win the battle? How do we win the battle of, uh, over sin in our lives? One, we've got to know that there's a danger and it's real and it's Satan. And we've got to know that sin is real. 
But we've also got to know he's a defeated foe because Jesus triumphed over him. How do we triumph over him? By the blood of the one who was victorious over him. We give our lives, we commit our lives to him. We say, cover me in your blood, your righteous blood, and make me whole, make me pure. And it says that they triumphed by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They they held firm to the word of the gospel. They held firm in the midst of the battle to what God said was true. And they didn't give in to the lies. In fact, the proof that they held firm was that they were willing to die for this testimony. They were willing to die for Jesus Christ. They thought it was more important to die than to live a lie. You see, it's really, really, really crazy because when it comes to God, Conquering sometimes looks like being conquered in the world's eyes. Jesus came, and it looked like he was conquered and defeated, but he rose. Here, the ones who triumph are what? Are those who lose their lives. The ones who conquered are the ones who look like they were being conquered by the enemy. Isn't it it weird? Isn't it crazy how God works? We've got to stop looking at the world's definitions of what it means to live. For me to live is Christ. That's how we need to live. So therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. You see, now we, we had a, a, a Satan, an accuser who was in heaven, who was, who was just like blaspheming all day long and cursing at God and saying how terrible these people are and how terrible God is. And he's in his face and God says, enough, you're out of here. And so what does he do? He goes down to the earth and he is riled up. And he's ready to take some people. He's filled with fury because why? Because he knows he can't win. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. He couldn't beat the kid. He couldn't beat the son. He couldn't beat the Savior. So he goes back and he attacks the woman. He attacks Israel. But something happened. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to a place prepared for her. The story picks back up from earlier. In the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and time and a half. Three and a half years out of the serpent's reach. So for three and a half years, God's people are taken away. They're taken care of. He is protecting them. Satan can't do anything. He's trying to attack them. They were taken with the wings of an eagle. In Exodus 19, it said, referring to Israel's, Israel and, and what happened with, with Moses and when they were taken and rescued from the Egyptians, God looks, he says, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. You see, God is going to do the same thing with his people. Someday, he is going to have some supernatural protection. And I don't know how he's going to get his people into a place in the wilderness. When the Bible says they're going to be in the wilderness, he's going to do it. Satan knows what the Bible says, and still, he's not going to be able to get them. He's going to try. He's going to try. It says, then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. The imagery is so cool. There have been other times that Satan tried to use water to kill God's people. Egypt. All the newborn babies were thrown into the Nile because he was trying to wipe out the seed of Jesus Christ. But then in some crazy twist of fate, you know, God, uh, God knew in his sovereignty what was going to happen. He took his people and he walked them through the Red Sea on dry land. He split the sea and let him walk through on dry land. And so now Satan's going to come back and he's going to try to do something with water. I don't, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know if it's imagery for, um, for actual water that he's going to try to pour a flood or do something. But regardless, the earth is going to swallow it up. God's not going to let it happen. He's not going to let his people be, be killed and be taken out. And so what does Satan do? 
The dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Who's the offspring of, of Israel? Who's the metaphorical offspring? The church. Because Israel produced Jesus Christ the seed, and from that seed, the, the church was born. And so we today get to live in Christ Jesus because of that. But one day in the future, something's going to happen, and, and Satan is not going to have any access in heaven. He's not going to have been able to defeat Jesus, and he's not going to be able to get pe- God's chosen people, the Israelites, Israel, the Jews. And so what he's going to do is he's going to turn away from the ones who are in the wilderness and protected, and he's going to attack everybody else in the world. Who what? Who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. That does not sound like a fun place to be, right? I mean, if I'm being honest, I don't don't want to be on that side of things. I don't want to be in a a position where God says, you need to literally give your life for me in this moment. I don't want to do that. Because I'm like, well, God, you're too small to take care of my family if I do that. God, you're too small to take care of the church. God, you're too small to de- God, you're too small because we believe Satan's lies. And so we're put in a position where we don't want to do the things God's telling us to do when really we should be in a place where we're saying, I'm going to keep God's commands and I'm going to hold fast to my testimony about Jesus even if it means that my life is on the line. My spiritual life, my physical life, my reputational life, my social life. What are the types of your life that are being held on the line that God says, I want you to stand up for me. The battle, the war has been won, but we're still in the midst of a battle. I want you to stand up for me. What are the battles that we're in every single day that we believe Satan's lies that say, God is too small to handle my situation if 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 I continue to trust him in this moment? I would rather give in to sin. I would rather give in to Satan's lies. We have an enemy that hates us. And you can see the steps. He tried to take down the woman. He tried to take down Jesus. He went back and tried to take down the woman. And now he's trying to get, take down his church. He's trying to take out those who have, who have received him as their Lord and Savior. He doesn't like it. We are in a struggle that is bigger than ourselves. We have an enemy that's relentless. And he's going to continue to wage war against God and his people and us. So how do we triumph? How do we overcome this spiritual darkness, this wickedness, this evil, this sin by the blood of the Lamb? In the word of our testimony. God, you're enough, you're enough, you're enough. I believe the word that says... God, you overcame death. Death was arrested and now it can be arrested in me. I serve a risen Savior. Because of that, we're victors. We don't have to give in to sin. Worship team is going to come on up as we're going to sing and, and remind ourselves of the battle. But what are we doing? What's the take home? What, What are some of the stuff that that we have to be paying attention to? Well, we need to remember to know the danger. The danger is the bull, and the thing is, this bull is limited. He can't go outside of his fence. He can't do anything to you that God would not allow him to do. And if God allows him to do it, then praise God. Because there must be something special about being in a place where God says, I'm going to let you die for me. It's crazy, but it's upside down thinking. It's who God is. But we have to remember that when you mess with the bull, you get the horns, right? So don't go looking for a fight with Satan. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Stand firm in your faith. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist him. He's going to flee from you. Be alert, be of sober mind, pay attention because your enemy, the devil, your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He wants to eat us up. 
Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. Because why? Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Those people in Ukraine right now, those people in Russia, how many, how many people have been praying for Russia? Yeah, we, play, we, we pray for Ukraine, but there's, there are people in Russia that don't want this. There are Russians all around the world who are being looked at sideways now because their country has invaded another one. We've got to stand firm with these believers. We've got to resist the devil. We've got to know the difference between perception and reality. Perception says Satan wins. Perception says people are dying and God doesn't care. Reality is God sent his son. And he snatched the victory that day when he returned to heaven. And we've got to remain faithful by living in God's word. And I put living there in in quotes. Because living in God's word looks like reading it and knowing it and loving it. Knowing the stories of what God's done and how he's shown up so that when we go in this world and we have a scenario that's similar, that parallels something that the Israelites went through or something that Gideon went through or something that Jesus or Peter or Paul or Mary, all of them, something they went through, we know this is how God secured the victory and this is what it looks like in my life. Some people he healed and some people he didn't. But I guarantee you there's a bunch of people who were not healed in this life who are living in heaven happily. They're joyous. Remain faithful by living in God's word. Will you pray with me this morning? Dear God, we pray that you will help us to keep you the focus of our lives. I pray that we will see the finished work at the cross. I pray that we won't give in to Satan's lies. I pray that we won't fall in the trap of thinking that we're not good enough, so it's okay to continue to not be good enough, God. I pray we'll say no, 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 no to Satan. God, you love us. You love me. And I want to serve you. This battle belongs to you, God. I pray that's, that's our prayer, that we will fight on our knees, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.